Yeah. There were just a lot of misconceptions, I think, actually, about what intelligent right, design exactly. is. Yeah. Could you, just for the sake of clarity, define what you would say intelligent design actually yeah, is? Yeah, it's really interesting you would ask that because I also remember a, a BBC4 debate I did with David Attenborough, and mm. he was so dismissive, mm. but he was arguing with a form of creationism from the 1960s or something. He had really no idea about what our actual perspective was or arguments were. Um, the, some quick definition, intelligent design is the idea that there are certain features of life and the universe that are best explained by the action or activity of a designing mind or intelligence rather than a strictly undirected or unguided process such as, for example, natural selection acting on mm -hmm. random mutations in the area of biology. So what are the features kind of would that encompass when it comes sure, to Sure, there have been right. a number of things that have attracted the attention of proponents of the theory of intelligent design. One is the uh, one that John has already mentioned, the, the fine tuning mm -hmm. of the universe, the yeah. idea that the fundamental parameters of physics fall within these exceedingly narrow tolerances outside of which uh, life and even basic chemistry in the universe would be impossible. Uh, an another is the, also the fine tuning of our planetary yeah. system. It's not only that the universe as a whole is fine tuned from the very beginning, it's that our, our planetary system is fine tuned to allow for the possibility. I mean, we, we had a wonderful sort of demonstration of that with the Aurora Borealis, didn't we? Yeah. Just a, a week or two ago. And the fact that we can enjoy that is because, in a sense, our planet is set up remarkably to help us uh, defend from the, the worst solar radiation and that we kind of thing. We just had this a, eclipse yeah. not long ago exactly, as well, yeah, which yeah, is yeah, another, yeah, you know, yeah. some of our, our mm. writers, uh, Guillermo Gonzalez and Jay Richards have written mm. about the importance mm. of eclipses, not only um, in, in revealing that our place in the, in the solar system is perfectly designed to make scientific discoveries, which is another yeah, yeah. aspect of it. Yeah. In biology, you have things like the discovery of the little tiny miniature nanomachines, uh, rotary engines, turbines, uh, sliding clamps, little robotic walking motor proteins that mm. tow vesicles of material along what are essentially railroad tracks. You have this whole autom you know, this uh, kind of uh, there's a, uh, a kind of automated factory aspect to what's going on inside cells. Uh, and then for me, the thing that has most attracted my attention from the very beginning and what mm. got me into this mm. was the the discovery uh, again here in this city of the information bearing properties of DNA and RNA and the, these other large biomacromolecules, and um, the DNA we now know is not only uh, contains information in a, in a digital form, but it also is part of a comprehensive information storage, transmission, and processing system. In 1992, when I was here, uh, I came back after I'd finished the PhD and did a, a, a summer's research project with Paul Nelson, who's here tonight, William Dembski, who's one mm. of our key, um, our, our, our key researchers, uh, but Doug Axe, who's here tonight, came in one day and he was working at the MRC on a long-term postdoc in molecular biology. And he was, we, we booked him for an hour to give us a, 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 a sketch of the, in, the, the, what's called the gene expression system, or the, mm. the means by which DNA directs the construction of proteins and protein machines. It ended up being an eight-hour <laughs> exposition wow. of this extraordinary system. Yeah. And at the, end of the, at the end of the discussion, Dembski was already had already uh, nailed his colors to the wall, and, and Nelson was a well-known proponent of intelligent design. But I said, Doug, I said this is extraordinary. You went, you did your PhD at Caltech. You're here at Cambridge, and it sounds like you also see evidence of intelligent design. And he just said, Well, you went to Cambridge, stupid. <laughs> you see it too, you know. And so, yeah. and that was for us in a way a, mm. a germination of, uh, of of a research group because. Yeah. We, we, at, at that meeting, I remember Paul Nelson got up to the, 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 the whiteboard. We were in the hex at, over at Tyndall, mm, and mm, the Tyndall people yeah. had kindly made use of, yeah. or made, made uh, that available to us. And I asked Paul, how many more people do you know like this that have this perspective? And he got up and he wrote 15 names on the table, or yeah. on, on, on the whiteboard, of people who had, re had recently minted PhDs from places like where he was, University yeah. of Chicago, and Harvard, and, and Berkeley, and Oxford, and Cambridge. And we thought, wait, this isn't supposed to be happening. Wow. Yeah. And, and that's, that's kind of when it we began felt to felt like think. you were uncovering a sort of a shared secret almost, you know, among well, the scientific Well, we all thought we were, we were entertaining these disreputable ideas in isolation. Right. There was no one else. You suddenly realized there were, there were other people who thought exactly the same way. Yeah, exactly. Now, turning to the name of the new center, the Huell Center for Science and Natural Theology, perhaps again you could define natural theology and just explain how that interacts with intelligent design as well. Well, right. Um, so I uh, kindly mentioned the, uh, the books that I've, I've written recently. And the, the first two 
made the case for uh, a designing intelligence of some kind mm. as the best explanation for, example, the information bearing properties in DNA. And just to quickly sketch that argument, if you think of what we're here in the Watson room, uh, of the two, I have more admiration for Crick. He was a code breaker in World <laughs> okay. War II. And they both they jointly elucidated the, the structure of the DNA molecule with help from, from Rosalind Franklin and Wilkins. Uh, but in 58, Crick took it further. And he realized that DNA uh, was uh, along the interior of the double helix. There were these four chemical subunits, which chemists today label with the letters A, C, G, and T. And that's because he realized that they were, and with, with uh, deference to Steve, they were literally functioning mm. as alphabetic characters in a written language would do, or as digital characters in yeah. a section of machine code. They had the function of typographic characters in a, in a, in a section of text. And that was, that's called the sequence hypothesis. And I think it's an even more fundamental um, uh, uh, discovery than even the structure of mm. DNA itself. Mm. And it took about seven years for that to be confirmed in this period of the, the what's sometimes called the molecular biological revolution. Mm. Mm. And so out of that comes a realization that DNA is functioning like a software program. Mm. And D, our, our local hero back in Seattle, Bill Gates, has said as much. Richard Dawkins has, has acknowledged mm. the exact same thing. It's, mm. it's functioning like machine yeah. code. Yeah. And what we know from our uniform and repeated experience, which is a very Hewellian thing to say, appealing to our uniform experience as the basis of an explanation, what we know from our uniform and repeated experience is that information, especially in a digital or alphabetic or typographic form, always arises from an intelligent source. Mm. Whether we're talking about a hieroglyphic inscription or a paragraph in a book, or the information embedded in a radio signal or information in a computer code, if you trace that information back to its ultimate source, you always come to a mind, not a material process. And so in the first two books that I wrote, it was about the information problem that had confronted evolutionary biologists, first at the point of the origin of life, at the origin of the first cell, and then again, when we look at the abrupt appearance of major new forms of life in the history of life as we encounter it in events such as the Cambrian explosion, which mm. is, was the subject of my second book. Mm. Mm. And so in those books, I was arguing for the need for an intelligent agency of some kind to explain the origin of the information mm. necessary to produce the first cell and necessary to produce all the new cell types that would go into making an animal form. Yeah. Yeah. But then my readers had a question, and that was, well, who do you think the intelligence <laughs> is? It's a fair question, it's to be fair, fair question. Steve. And, yeah. and what can yeah. science tell us about yeah. us, about that? And then, so, and, and I was going to say, it, that's, that's where the new book comes that's in. That's where the new yeah. book comes in. Because you, also, you, you kind of hadn't really talked about God explicitly in those first two books. I mean, obviously, they are, in a sense, um, talking about the whole idea of natural theology yeah, at some level. Yeah. But, but, it's, but you really made a, a conscious decision to, to talk about God in the new book. I did, and I, because it is a natural question, and, yeah. and it's the question of natural theology. Yeah. So intelligent design allows you, with using standard methods of scientific reasoning, to infer an agent or a mind of some kind. Mm. So we would, we would uh, characterize that or classify that as a form of historical scientific reasoning where historical sciences are particularly concerned with inferring causal origins, determining causal origins. And it's just interesting, a great connection to Huell here because in my PhD dissertation, looking at the methods of historical scientific reasoning, Huell was the first person to characterize those and to show that they were different than mm. what you would do in, say, laboratory or experimental or bench science, where you're looking for regularities, mm. where Huell said in the historical sciences, you're wanting to infer mm. back to a past cause, to an event that can explain mm. the things you see. Mm. Um, so uh, in any case, the first two books were, were formulating a design hypothesis as a, we thought, we think a properly historical scientific hypothesis. The, the third book was then venturing into the area of natural theology, which is addressing the question, well, what can nature tell us about God specifically? Because, I, and what I did in the, second, in the third book was look not just at the evidence from, of design and biology, but I went back to those cosmological questions. Because if you think of the evidence of design and biology, it's at least logically possible that um, that you have an, the, the intelligence responsible for the information and information processing mm. In, mm. In, in life 
is an imminent intelligence within the cosmos because life arises mm. long mm. after the beginning of the mm. universe. But when you look at the fine tuning of the universe, and, and by imminent intelligence, I'm actually talking about a space alien. We've had no, <laughs> yeah, no less yeah. a personage than Francis Crick himself mm. and Richard Dawkins have both yeah. floated this idea of panspermia, a space a anything alien Anything but designer. God. <laughs> yeah, exactly, it, the anything but God yeah. hypothesis. Yeah, yeah actually, actually when Ben Stein got done interviewing uh, Richard Dawkins for the film Expelled, and Dawkins, maybe in an ill-advised moment, floated the idea that maybe the signature of intelligence that we see inside the cell, he used that phrase. Wow. He said, maybe it's the result of, a, of an intelligence from some other uh, planet or star system mm. that has been seeded here. <laughs> and Ben Stein got off the set and said, I call that the, o, uh, the uh, OBG hypothesis. And we said, what's that, Ben? He said, Anything but God. <laughs> so, <laughs> I love that. Um, in any case, new book. I said, well, what if we look at the cosmological evidence? Mm. Because no space alien within the universe could be responsible for the fine tuning of the universe that would make its future, presumably, evolution mm. possible. Mm. Mm. And no alien within the cosmos could explain the origin of the universe, the cosmos itself. Yeah. Yeah. So when you when you bring in the cosmological evidence, the evidence of a beginning and the evidence mm. of the fine tuning of the universe from the beginning, you get. I think using a, a, yeah. a, a consilience of inductions, a uh, will phrase, synthesizing those three pieces of evidence, the information we have in life, the fine tuning we have from the beginning of the universe, and the evidence for a beginning, theism provides the best overall explanation. Not a, not a space alien designer, uh, not, a, not a deistic creator either, because we have evidence of design long after the beginning of the universe, and the deistic creator only acts at the beginning. So I do a kind of, in the book, a sort of philosophical survive, uh, survivor yeah. game, yeah. Yeah. looking at the competing explanations to see which provides the best overall. I, and I would be happy to call it a metaphysical explanation in this case, bringing in God as, a, as an explanation for, as John likes to put it, the whole show. Yeah, wonderful.